Can everybody hear me? There you go. There's your intro. <clears throat> Thanks. <laughs> Mystical, magical. Um, I haven't timed this out, talk out yet. This is the first time I've given it, so it might run a little long. Or short. Probably short, because I talk fast. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. Media hype and information security industry or big hacks that never really happened. Who am I? I'm Space Road. I was a member of Loft Heavy Industries. I created the WACMAC Archives. Testified in front of Congress on weak computer security and government. Ran the uh, Hacker News Network. Gave a talk on that yesterday. Hopefully some of you saw it. Not many people are in the room. So, um, so that's me. Yay. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about what is media hype. I'm going to go through several examples in depth, and we're going to hopefully draw some conclusions on that. Media. We all know what media is. Newspaper, televisions, magazines, places we get our news from. Hype. I love this definition. When I looked it up, I was like, oh, this is perfect, right? To create interest in by flamboyant or dramatic methods. To intensify by ingenious or questionable claims or methods. This fits perfect, so I had to put it in here. Um, <clears throat> we all sort of know what hype is, hopefully, uh, but we may not recognize it when we see it. So uh, before I get into the examples, these are not really presented in any sort of order. Um, they're sort of chronological, but not really. The older the story is, the harder it has been for me to actually research it, especially the reality part. Okay, It's easy to research the hype because it was everywhere. It was hyped up. The reality it doesn't tend to get as much press as the hype, unfortunately. These types of stories that I'm going to show to you, while they're sort of spread out over the last decade, um, they happen every day. I mean, I see them in the news all the time. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll be able to recognize them more, close, better. Um, I'm not covering hype over sort of theoretical attacks. I mean, we all heard about printers catching fire and blowing up. And, and people breaking into your car and jackpotting ATMs. There's a lot of hype surrounding those talks, and some of that was justified and some of it won't, but I'm not covering that in this particular talk. So my first question is, is Kevin Mitnick here? No? Good. I can talk, I can talk about him. Um, you, may, you may have heard this, especially back in you know, the 90s when it actually happened. Mitnick was basically blamed for breaking into NORAD and had the capability of launching nuclear weapons. Okay, we can all laugh about this now, but in you know the mid '90s, this was really taken as a serious threat. <clears throat> um, so the New York Times reported that he could, uh, as a teenager, he could use a computer and a modem to break into NORAD, and inspired or foreshadowed the '83 movie War Games. Right, St. Petersburg Time, 1995, an entire year later. Uh, Mitnick, as a teenager, Spalvik, California, infiltrated the North American Air Defense Command commuter system. <laughs> right? CNN in 1999. Now, one thing as I go through some of these examples, keep track of the dates, okay? So here we got 94, 95, and 1999. In 1999, CNN is still reporting this as fact, right? And that he inspired the 1983 film War Games. Well, the reality is a little bit less flamboyant. Uh, in 1996, Katie Hafner, who, if you remember, actually wrote the book Cyberpunk, which profiled Kevin Mitnick, uh, she was also a senior editor of Newsweek, uh, she said that she could find no evidence that the NORAD story was anything but myth. And that's in 1996, okay? Remember, CNN reported in 1999 that it was still a fact, right? So Kevin Mitnick's book, Ghost in the Wires, I don't know how many of you read this, um, before I read this book, I was actually talking with Kevin on email, and I'm like, dude, what can you tell me about this NORAD story? Because um, I wanted, I knew it was fake, and I wanted to put it in this, in this talk, and he stopped talking to me after I sent him the email. So, <laughs> Anyway, in his book, he's talking about, and he says that Leon, I can't pronounce these names, Leon Weidman evidently was the prosecutor for one of his early cases. Um, and he said he can whistle into a telephone and launch a nuclear missile from NORAD. All right, I don't know how many people can whistle a modem tone, even at, even at 300 baud, or it's just not going to happen. But this is a federal prosecutor who actually said this in court. Uh, try, that's why Mitnick was locked up in solitary. Um, this quote that Mitnick has in his book, he dates it 
uh, after War Games had come out, right? So it's more likely that the uh, War Games inspired this hype story about, about Mitnick as opposed to the other way around. Um, oh, there was another point I wanted to make. Oh, well. All right. So that's the first example. Next example. This was uh, happened in 1999. This was a big story on Hacker News Network, if you remember back in the day. Uh, it was first reported by the Sunday Business. The Sunday Business was a newspaper in the UK. It's now out of business. Uh, I think they got bought by uh, uh, Financial Times or something. I don't remember. Uh, it was picked up by Reuters and then spread over basically every newspaper in the country. Uh, Orlando Sentinel, hackers seize Britain's military satellite. Fox News, Britain's military satellite held by hackers, blah, blah, you know, Slashdot picked it up. Um, it was a big news story on Monday morning when people woke up. Uh, of course, except on H&M, because we said it was bullshit then, and we knew it was. This is the actual story. It's the whole story, okay? I don't know if you can actually read this. I don't know. Hopefully, my font's not too small. But I, I want to point out some, some, some parts of this story. Quoting security sources, uh, the sources said, said one intelligent source, uh, one security source said. If you look at this story, there's absolutely no verifiable facts in the entire story. But yet, the hackers altered the course of the satellite. And, and this is, a, it's, I like this example because it's short and it, you can read the whole article. Uh, that's what, one of the reasons why it's in here. Um, I don't like it because it's old and it's actually hard to do the research on it and find the links. But... Uh, <coughs> This, after <coughs> H&N, actually H&N was one of the first uh, news organizations that called bullshit on this story, um, and it was actually able to get Reuters to publish a retraction. Now, of course, the retraction for this story was not published as widely as the original hype of the story was. Not every newspaper picked it up. Uh, ZDNet did. Uh, they were actually able to get some quotes from uh, the people in the UK who were responsible for satellites, and they said it never, never happened. Granted, this hack-proof quote is a bunch of malarkey, but we'll let that slide. Um, so one thing that's interesting about this story and a, a lot of hyped stories that you see in the media is that they have a very long tail, right? They, they live on forever and ever and ever and ever, especially with Google and people trying to do searches. And, and since it's hard to do the research on the older stories and get the actual facts, uh, the, the hype lives longer than the reality. So in, 19, in uh, 2008, okay, this is a decade after this happened, PC Magazine writes an article called The Ten Most Mysterious Cybercrimes. And the number two most mysterious cybercrime of all time was this uh, satellite that got supposedly had its, its course altered, right? Well, this article was written by uh, Corini, Corini Cor I can't pronounce his name, Iozo. Or her name. I don't know if it's a him or her. This guy had never written an InfoSec article ever, at least not that I could find. He, te he mostly wrote articles uh, about technology bargains, like, you know, get your cheapest MP3 player, right? And if you look at this guy's bibliography even today, he has never written an InfoSec article since. So PC Mag picks up this no-name freelance reporter who writes this 10 Most Mysterious Cybercrimes, publishes it, and obviously doesn't do any fact-checking on it and leaves all the fact-checking up to the reporter who obviously just did a couple of Google searches and, and published a story. So, <clears throat> uh, another interesting story, next one. Uh, Al-Qaeda uses steganography. Now, a lot of you probably may have heard about this one. This was in uh, 2001, uh, and there was a big uh, fear that went out that uh, bin Laden and Al-Qaeda were, were sending secret messages back and forth uh, using... JPEGs and GIFs, right? Uh, <clears throat> may lie the encrypted blueprints of the next terrorist attack against the United States or its allies. You very well could have a photograph and image with the time and information of attack sitting on your computer and you would never know it. <laughs> oh my God, the world's going to end, right? <laughs> so Wired called bin Laden a steganog steganography master. Cryptogram even picked this up, terrorists and steganography. Now, again, you notice the dates here. The Cryptogram newsletter was September 30th, 2001. Um, everybody knows what steganography is, right? I hope so. I, I explained that. Okay. Sometimes I talk too fast and I forget what I've said. So, all right. 
<laughs> They're in the hype group, yes. Cryptogram newsletter, September 30th, 2001. Um, and uh, we'll get to the reality here in a second. But it, I, I put that in here because of the date, not because I want to call crap on Bruce, because Bruce is an awesome guy and can kick my ass every way to Sunday. Um, but it's interesting that even, you know, Wired, USA Today, Cryptogram Newsletter all picked this story up. <clears throat> but the reality was that in August of 2001, before the Cryptogram Newsletter came out, uh, some guys did a study uh, at the Center for Information Technology Integration. I want to say their names, Niels Provost and Peter Honeyman. All right, they downloaded 2 million images off the Internet and ran them all through a steganography checker, found squat, nothing. You know, you'd think they'd find even a random something that wasn't Al-Qaeda, but they didn't even find that. They found absolutely nothing. This was published that I found in one source at New Scientist. So the original got published in USA Today, Wired, Cryptogram Newsletter, probably a half dozen or another dozen sources. Uh, the, the reality got published in one location that I could find. All right. Um, good. Did you find the source? <clears throat> I'm sorry? Did I find the source of the hype? Yeah. Uh, not that I could verify. It was a band conference breakout group in January in New Orleans. It was a discussion about analysis of crypto tools, and they used that as an example. Now, now in the Al example, did they say that they actually had proof that Al-Qaeda was using steganography or that Al-Qaeda could use steganography? Could, yeah. And we'll get to that again. This, that, cut, that comes up again uh, in some of these other examples. Um, and I suspect that, and, and this next example too, that the intelligence community has a little bit to do with this um, and probably had some help in, in hyping up this particular story. Now, granted, they have ulterior, I don't want to say ulterior motives. They have strong motives to sort of hype some of this stuff up because they're trying to raise awareness and they're trying to get funding. And, and it's important for them to do that. Um, but at the same time, it's not actually true, right? So the next one delves into some of the intelligence uh, community a little bit, and we'll probably have some intelligent people here, so you're probably going to yell at me. Um, Brazil blackout. Some of you may remember this story. It was picked up by 60 Minutes. And they did a huge story on it. Um, Wired uh, had a quote from Richard Clark. And again, I don't want to rail on Richard Clark. The guy's way smarter than me. I respect him a lot. Um, but he was quoted by Wired as saying, we can look forward to the kinds of things happening here that happened to Brazil where hackers successfully brought down the power. All right, 60 Minutes <coughs> claims they had six different intelligence sources to verify their story. Uh, and it was even quoted by a speech that the president get, uh, gave, right? We know that cyber intruders have probed our electrical grid and that in other countries, cyber attacks have plunged entire cities into darkness, all right? According, uh, according to 60 Minutes, President Obama didn't say which country had been plunged into darkness, but a half dozen sources in the military, intelligence, and private security communities have told us the president was referring to Brazil. Now, I know a lot of people talk about the InfoSec echo chamber, and they were all sort of preaching to the choir and talking amongst ourselves. You want to see a bigger echo, cha echo chamber? Go into the intelligence community. It is a humongous chamber. And all you hear is echoes. Um, and of course, Richard Clark is a primary figure in the, infosec uh, in the intelligence community. So the reality. Um, Wired, again, now this was the Wired story was first broke October 28th. 60 Minutes reported on June 15, 2010. On November 9, 2009, right, before the 60 Minutes story came out, Wired had sourced the story, uh, basically sourcing it to sooty insulators, not hackers. All right. Uh, the second quote there, Brazil's independent systems operator group later confirmed that the failure of a kilowatt line was provoked by pollution in the chain of insulators due to deposits of soot. Uh, and in the first quote, which is one the bigger one, Brazil's electrical control systems are not directly connected to the Internet. <clears throat> so, you know, that was a pretty amazing hack that they did if, the, if that was true. And the 
even in Brazil, the electrical company that was responsible was fined 3.27 million, um, I believe, I don't know if that was dollars or pesos or whatever they use in Brazil, but a lot of money for failing to maintain the high voltage interest insulators on its transmission towers. So obviously, 60 Minutes just basically, even after it was proved wrong in 2009, 60 Minutes decided to go ahead with their story because they had six sources within the intelligence community that verified it. And even after the story aired and a lot of people pointed this out to them, they still would not retract their story. So, uh, where am I? Oh, ah, the next one. Yeah. I put this next, uh, this next example in here mostly because it's, I think it's kind of funny. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I just like saying Wiener a lot. <laughs> you probably all remember this story. Representative Wiener from New York uh, accidentally tweeted, or I'm sorry, the hype is that he had his Twitter account broken into and somebody posted naked pictures of himself or shirtless pictures or whatever they were. <laughs> right? Lewd photos sent over Representative Wiener's hacked Twitter account. Now, it's interesting, though, that uh, Reuters and the Huffington Post the next day uh, claim that Wiener has, Wiener has hired a lawyer after alleged Twitter hacking. Okay, if, if, you, if somebody breaks into your Twitter account, why do you need to hire a lawyer? Wouldn't you like contact Twitter? You know, maybe contact law enforcement or uh, why do you need a lawyer? Uh, that, 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 as soon as I saw that, I'm like, yeah, okay, this never happened. Um, that was on May 31st. Uh, by June 6th, he comes clean and says, ah, nobody hacked it, I, I sent the picture myself. Um, I take full responsibility for my actions, Wiener said. Uh, so yeah, I put that, that particular example in here because it's funny and I can say Wiener a lot. Uh, but it's not the only Twitter example, okay? Uh, Haley Williams, uh, lead singer for Paramore, she blamed hackers after she tweeted a topless picture of herself. Paul Pierce of the Boston Celtics blamed hackers after a tweet about a broom sweeping uh, uh, the Orlando Magic, right? Uh, so <clears throat> these, this, the, the hype sort of happens all the time is my point here, even though I get to say wiener. Um, all right, I think I've said it enough. <laughs> Another satellite hack, 2010 this time, a little bit more recent. Chinese military suspected in hacker attacks on U.S. satellites may have used an internet connection at the Salford Satellite Station in Spitsburg, Norway. So th this story is a little bit interesting because there's actually some sort of facts in here, right? We have a specific location that we can sort of try to verify. But none of the media reports when this story first came out actually called the satellite station and say, hey, what the hell happened at your, at your site? Did this really happen? Now this satellite station is a commercial station, right? They hire out their services to other companies to manage their satellite. If I'm in charge of a multi-million, probably billion dollar industry, right, my company's been hacked supposedly by the media, I'm going to release a statement saying this never happened or, you know, yes, it happened, but we're taking uh, preventative measures or something. But they never released a statement. The media never called them and said, hey, did this really happen? Um, the original source for the story was supposedly uh, this U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission. Who the hell is that? And why are they breaking this major story? Yeah. This one actually happened. Yeah, I, I'm getting to that. Um, it sort of happened, all right? Um, the, the, the hype here is way out of proportion to the reality. Now, the reality is that NASA experienced two suspicious events with a Terra spacecraft in the summer of fall of 2008. There was no manipulation of data, no command successfully sent to the satellite, and no data captured. So what the hell happened? All right, no manipulation of data, no command sent to the satellite, and no data captured. But yet we have two suspicious events. So obviously something happened, but was it really uh, hacker attacks U.S. satellites? China deny. Of course, China denies. They deny everything. Um, but I look at the the uh, the source of this 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 story. U.S. China Economic and Security Review Commission, and uh, I don't know who the hell they are. Why isn't somebody else breaking this story? Every year, they're, they're chartered by Congress, and they report on security issues affecting the United States. So if there's a threat, they report. Right, that's their job. Yeah. Right, and so they they obviously want to they obviously want to report on 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 big issues, get them more money. 
Um, and of course, China says that they had ulterior motives. Uh, their all motives may not have been as strong as China wants them to be, but I, I, I sort of agree with China on this one. Um, so yeah, obviously something happened here. Yeah, but what what the hell? What's a suspicious event? You know, and the suspicious event didn't actually involve anything serious happening. There's no manipulation of data, no command successfully sent the satellite, and no data captured. So, you know, like, big deal. They got some malware installed in their control system. Ooh. All right, so now another more recent example that you all may have heard about, Illinois' water utility. The hype. Water utility hackers destroy pump. I love the wired headline. Hackers 2.0, attack city water station. Destroy pump. Cyber intrusion, blame for hardware failures. Um, threat level was any, but this is in the hype, okay? In the hype stories, threat level was unable to reach anyone at the utility company Thursday night to confirm the breach, All right? DHS spokesman Peter Hoggard, at this time, there is no credible corroborated data that indicates a risk to critical infrastructure entities or a threat to public safety. This is in the hype articles. Right? As soon as the, the story breaks, there's already people silent and bullshit, but the media goes ahead and, and publishes the story anyway. Now, the source for this story uh, is, a, is a report out of a fusion center, which is uh, a part of DHS, Department of Homeland Security. Um, it was supposed to, I think it was a draft report. It wasn't supposed to be released. Um, and I won't name the, the security expert here. We, we all probably know who he is. But he got a hold of this report and thought, oh my goodness, this is, this is crazy. I gotta tell the media, I gotta alert the public. Um, and so the, the Register and Wired, basically their entire source for this whole story is this one guy who has a copy of a draft report that's not even released yet. Uh, and he's, he won't name the report, he won't name. And so it's all just a bunch of hype, basically. Um, it's really crazy. And this goes on for a week or two, like nobody knows what the hell's going on. Uh, the story broke November 17th, 2011. Uh, by November 25th, we get the real story. A contractor who was working at the Illinois water plant was on vacation in Russia and was remoting back in to check on the systems. <laughs> the IP showed up in the log is coming from Russia and everybody freaks out. Now, I won't get into the question of why a contractor has remote access. I want to get into the question of why remote access was allowed from a foreign country uh, and why this guy is checking on the plant while he's on vacation. Uh, but anyway, hype, reality. All right, that's all the big examples that I, could, that I had time to actually do the research for. There are a couple of extra uh, recent examples that have recently come up that I haven't had a chance to actually find all the links for and get the cool quotes out of. Um, there's been a lot of talk lately about Israeli and Palestinian hackers trading uh, DDoS attacks and a rising cyber gang war. Um, these guys are kind of posting a bunch of pastebin stuff to pastebin about SCADA systems. Somebody actually went through and looked at what they were posting, and like none of them are really SCADA. Uh, or if they are, you can't really get into them. Uh, so there really isn't this big cyber war that the media is hyping up about. Uh, Anonymous was quoted... <laughs> The other recent example was anonymous. They supposedly deleted CBS.com and took down Universal. There was an attack against CBS, but nothing actually got deleted. If you can imagine breaking into CBS and deleting all of their websites, uh, that's going to take some time, and it's not going to happen in 20 minutes, which is basically what these articles claim. Uh, more likely attack was that it was a DNS redirect. Uh, so there was something that happened there, but it wasn't deleted. Uh, hackers manipulate railway computers, TSA memo says. This is similar to the Illinois water attack. Uh, you probably heard about this one. There was a, the case is that in, north, in the northwest of the United States, a railway entity um, had their computers attacked and trains were slowed down. Uh, this is basically total, the TSA has come out and said this never happened. And again, this is from a draft report that was supposedly not supposed to be released. Uh, uh, by an organization I've never heard of. Um, and I, I wish I had more information on this one. I haven't had time to do the full research. But again, it's another example of media hype. Wow, I'm talking really fast. It's 24 minutes. All right. Um, so is lunch here yet? Yes. Oh, good. Let me wrap this up. So <clears throat> I, the points I want you to take away from all this 
is that just because a story is in every media outlet that you see doesn't really make it true, okay? It's on the internet, it has to be true. No, it doesn't. When you're reading these stories, try to look for facts, okay? Look for ways that you could verify the story if you wanted to, like a person's name, and you could call them up and ask them, okay? If there's no way to verify the story, if there's nameless quotes, a security expert said, you know, that's a big dead giveaway right there. If an, an unknown ent entity is blamed, oh, China did it, you know, hackers did it, uh, that's another good, good key point. If there's vague details, very few facts, uh, like the, the original 1990, 1999 story of the satellite getting taken over, uh, very few details. Uh, sensational claims, hackers control satellites. So I see that one about once, a, once every two or three years that comes up. Um, and if you ever see that story again, be very suspect. Trusted sources may not be. You know, if you look at some of the examples of the hype, you know, we're looking at CNN, Wired, Fox News. Uh, these are major media outlets that people trust to get their news every day. Uh, so just because it's reported uh, by Fox News doesn't mean it's true. Problems with these types of hype stories are that it could create, it, or it's going to create, or has created a chicken little effect. Oh my God, the sky is falling. What are we going to do? Hackers are going to roll the world, right? Or the boy who cried wolf effect. Uh, this is already starting to happen with the TSA right now with the Illinois water attack and the railroad attack uh, that never happened. Uh, and so people are going to hopefully question these attacks again in the future. Um, but it makes us all look bad, uh, those of us who use the hacker monitor anyway, moniker. Um, so when you read your media every day and you, and you check your news sources in the morning, question the story. You know, just ask yourself the question, you know, is this really true? Did this really happen? Can I believe this? Can I try to verify it? Um, so that's my talk. Here's my bibliography. I think I got 36 links here. Um, any questions? I know everybody's hungry. Yes. Thomas, um, did you get the one here back in the last month or so that the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, where the guy supposedly was hacking infrastructure and all of these were steals of or copy over the source code? Yeah, that was a there was a story. There was a big hype. Uh, Federal Reserve Bank got hacked and lost all the, and, and whatnot. And basically, a guy copied a bunch of source code to a hard drive and walked out the door. Um, so yeah, and that was a big hype because it was a Federal Reserve Bank. If that happens at you know uh, ABC computer comp company down the street, nobody's going to care, right? But because it's a Federal Reserve Bank, it gets a lot of press and media attention. So, uh, any other questions or comments? Yeah. I think you at least have to make an effort. So yeah, the question is, uh, if you're quoted by a media outlet and the, and the reporter gets it wrong, um, how much responsibility do you have to sort of correct that? Um, first, if you're, if you're getting quoted by media, vet your media sources first before you give them a quote. Uh, don't just talk to anybody who calls up and says, yeah, I report for the Seattle Post-Gazette and I'm looking for a quote. If you don't know who the guy is, you haven't done some research on who the reporter is and looked at, do a quick Google search and see what kind of stories he's written before. Don't be talking to Corinne Izio, who's never written an InfoSec story before and writes, writes MP3 player stories, you know. Um, second, if you do get misquoted, uh, you have to make an effort. Contact the reporter, try to contact his editor, uh, make your own blog post. Uh, we sh I assume we all have blogs or at least tweet about it or something so that if somebody like me is coming up after the fact and trying to do the research, that I'll hopefully find your, your, your rebuttal of what the reporter said. Um, there's so only so much you can do, and a lot of times the reporters just will not pull their story or change their quotes, and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, and and we, we ran into that all the time when we were at the loft, and that's why a lot of times we wouldn't talk to reporters at all because we just couldn't do the research on the reporter and find out where they were coming from. Um, and there was a couple of times when we got taken by bad reporters. MTV comes to mind. Um, that was not a good, good story. Uh, anyway, uh, another topic. Now, any other comments or questions? You can talk to me at lunch if you want. I'm hungry. Uh, I ran through this really, really quick. Uh, I guess I can add some more examples for the next version. If you have any feedback on the talk in general, I'd like to hear it. It's the first time I've given it. Um, so I guess that's it. You have anything? I guess it's lunch.
All right, lunch.